Thank you for tuning in to the Refuge Church YouTube channel. We pray that you're blessed by the message. Let's join the service already in progress. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming, indescribable Uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow? Who imagined the sun and give source to its light? Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. You are amazing, God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by amazing God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim, you are amazing God. Indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Incomparable, unchangeable. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. You are amazing. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, 
no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. Yeah. And this is my prayer in the battle when triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ, so firm on his promise I'll stand. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory in me. formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he And this is my prayer in the harvest when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again. The seed I've received, I will sow. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Keep my eyes 
above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours. You are mine. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves. My soul will rest in your embrace. The 
joy comes in the morning and when the oceans rage i don't have to be afraid because i know that you love me your love never fails no no your love never fails no no you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning
your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship him, church. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. He has done great things in your life. Praise him. Great are you, Lord. Thank you for those things that he's done in your life. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great and mighty things have you done in our lives, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Father, we praise your name. Oh, Father, you've taken us out of the darkness into your marvelous light. Father, you meet every one of our needs. Father, you said you'd never leave us. You'd never forsake us, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Father, you have us when our feet can't touch the bottom anymore. Father, we walk towards you on that water when we're called, and we know that you'd never call us into danger. Father, we praise you. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we praise your name. We glorify your name this morning. Father, we thank you for that. And this body says, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Somebody has got a testimony about great things that God is doing. Who is it? What is it? What is it? What did God do? It was something. What's that? Thank you. You got it. Praising God. And he said, there is somebody that has got a testimony about great things. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. There are principles that are 
There are principles that are being taught, preached, given in everything that you see. Some people realize it and understand it. Most of them don't. We're watching a movie the other day. And in the movie, there's a young girl that's blind from birth. So, a man who is blind from birth, but has learned to uh, walk the land, he bring, takes her in. And then he takes her to a place where a, there were young women or women that are in that same situation are put together and then they teach her how to live life, how to do the things that she needs to do. And um, he would then come in every periodically and he would teach her the things that he knows and then he would leave. Well, she grows up. She's a beautiful young woman and she's out there going through life. In, in this life, she's searching. She doesn't know if he's her father. She remembers him. And she knows that she knows that he loves her. Before, with the father before the foundation of the earth. Everybody is on that journey because there's something missing in their lives. They need that love. They look for love. Some of it, of course, in the wrong places. But then along comes a man. He teaches you the way, the truth, and the life. And through him, you find, you find that true you always rest, and you always want it. And then you start a new journey, and the Holy Spirit leads you to those that are looking for that love. And that's your calling. That's our purpose. According to the will of the Father. Praise you, Father. It is amazing when you go through this life and, I mean, we are who we are, right? <laughs> and things occur that are just, they're, they're mind-blowing. And you look at that and you go, man, God's walking right with me. You know, I could have fallen and, 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 you know, something bad happened, but God was right there, no matter what it was. I, that could have happened, but God, I mean, it's just so, and, and it's overwhelming to you that you're almost just speechless. And no one else is around. That testimony is yours. You're, somebody walks over and goes, God's not real, and you go, There's, sorry, but... Absolutely, every minute, every second of the day, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. You know, but by the grace of God, so go we. And I look at that, and I just think that's incredible. I know there are more testimonies than that. I know that there are more testimonies than that. Man, I'm telling you that just as we talk about things and, and see how God's moving, it is incredible. It is incredible. And don't be bashful to share that kind of stuff. When, there's, when something good is going on, that is an encouragement Laid on. Wow. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God is faithful. God is faithful. It, it doesn't require some big, huge effort from you. I think that's a lie of the enemy. You know, you have to accomplish something. You have to do something. You know, that's, that's a lie, the enemy. What you have to do is you have to read God's word and go, that's real. I know it. I'm, that's settled. That, that's done. There's concrete's dry. There's nothing else. I know that that's what it is. And as you walk your life out going, that's what God's word says. That's it. I don't care how much stuff on the outside tries to shake you and tell you that's not the way it works or that's not what happens. When you read God's word and you go, no, that's what it says, you are going to see things that are unthinkable. They're, they're like eight, uh, 86 years old, and this man has preached the word in L.A. I mean, he was in L.A. before L.A. was what it was today. And he is down there doing the good work. And he said, what does he do? He doesn't say, yeah, I need to take this week off. He says, what is it? My teeth are done. Everything's done. All right, let's get going. I mean, that, that's the word right there. That's the word. Man, I tell you, that's, that's God. It has been coming up more and more that uh, we need to understand that leaning on our own understanding is something that is, is not going to pan out. Leaning on our own understanding is, not, is something that is not going to bring us victory. See, it, there are times when uh, we go through these things and we start noticing that inside this world, you start thinking, well, that makes sense. Somebody explain something. Oh, well, God, he's a loving God, and he wouldn't... Uh, take us down that path because that's not a loving God. He wouldn't. He would love that. He would not hurt those people. And you start going, well, yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's the world's thinking. That's that's what the world processes. That's how the world does it. That's why we had the Word given to us because we lean on His understanding. And you go, well, I don't know what God would think about that. I don't know what God would say about that. That's why He gave you His Word because anything, everything that has to do with life. Everything that has to do with godliness, everything that has to do with his will, it's right there. He gave it to us. So we can go through there and read that. And you go, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, when you get to one of those things where you say, I'm not sure about that, there's one thing that is for sure. He is sure. So if you get, well, I'm not sure about that, then you just trust that. You know, it's um, when we were flying, we were, uh, the, we were flying uh, planes, small aircraft. And one of the things they were teaching, uh, Donna and I, was learning how to fly by the uh, instruments. It was called uh, IFR, Instrument Rated Flying. And as we were going through the, the training, the one thing that they were teaching us was, don't lean on these. Because when you're flying that plane and you get into a cloud bank, you feel as though you're climbing, so you push down. Or you feel like you're going down, so you push up. And either way, you're going to crash into the ground, and you're going to stall the plane and crash. They said, what you look at is the gauges. When there's a gauge that says you are climbing or you are descending, you follow that gauge. So you literally don't even look out the window anymore. You look at that gauge, and you go, all right, it needs to go up, it needs to go down. And what are we making adjustments on? The gauge. It doesn't make any difference what I'm seeing out here. What we're seeing out here is not relevant. What we are seeing right here is relevant. So we go like this. We're going to fly by the gauges. Because we get into a situation that starts to look like, well, I don't know if that's right. Maybe I should turn a little bit. Maybe I should compromise in this area. You don't look out there. You look down here at the gauges. And you go, no, no, I'm on track right now. I don't need to compromise in that at all. Because this thing says straight and true is right here. And that's what we do. We fly by the gauges. Because, uh, oh, for the sake of the children, yanking on our emotions, yanking, tugging on our emotions is the only thing that enemy's got to work with. When he comes at us, he's hitting those fiery darts at us, what is he doing? He's plunging those thoughts into our thinking. 
He's plunging them over and over and over, and that's why we're supposed to cast down those thoughts and imaginations and anything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. So when something comes in and goes, oh, well, that's not right. God's being mean. You look at it and you go, God's just. God's just, he's righteous, he's merciful, and he has grace. And whatever God says, that's what we're going to do. I think it was Billy Graham's wife that said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. So that's, that's how we do it. We just settle it right down to that. All right, so we're in, uh, we're in <coughs> John, and we're creeping up on, on the end here of chapter 1, and I'm not saying we're going to go this speed the whole way, but I think we're going to take whatever God's got for us every step of the way. We're not in a rush. But we get to uh, 1 John, or I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse 35. We're going to start talking about disciples. That's what we're going to pull out of this. This is where he starts calling his disciples. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, it is always right. Lord, it is your name. It is the very essence of who you are. There is no compromise. There is no, no uh, lack inside that word. Father, anything that we need, we find right there inside that word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We thank you for it. We thank you for this word. Holy Spirit, thank you for being the teacher. Thank you for teaching and guiding and leading. As we go through this message that you want to speak to us about the disciples, break it down. Take it into a place that everyone will be able to receive this exactly how they learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So here we are, uh, John chapter 1, verse 35, and it says, Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And I've got to, I've got to look at that and I've got to think. When John is standing there talking to people, you know, he's having a conversation like we do here. You're not always talking to everybody that's sitting here. So you're sitting here having a conversation with somebody and then Jesus walks by. Every single time, he's got to stop and go, Hey, whoa. That's the Lamb of God. I mean, it's just overwhelming him. I mean, he's over here talking, okay, we've got to go get some wood for the fire. Okay, great. Jesus starts walking. He's grabbing somebody. He goes, hey, look, that's the Lamb of God. I mean, it has overwhelmed him. He is looking at this going, everything about the existence of man is going to change with that Lamb right there that's walking by. I mean, it's not just a, oh, that? Oh, yeah, that's the Lamb of God. No, this guy, he's overwhelmed. He gets it. Uh, 37, the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. That's awesome. Verse 38 says, Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say translated teacher, Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now, it was about the 10th hour. Now, I've got it figured the 10th hour is going to put it at about, if it starts at 6, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? Just because they started at 6 in the morning. Jesus says, what is it that you seek? What he's asking is, what is it that your heart desires? He's, he's cutting to the chase real quick. What is it that you're searching for? See, Jesus is laying the foundation here for what it means to be a disciple of his. What is it that you value? He's cutting right to the chase. What is it? You recognize that you're missing something. What is it that you were searching for to satisfy it? See, you could have rock star status, and they're following everybody, and the, the rock star just says, oh, great, lots of people are following me. And these guys started to follow. He stops and he turns and he goes, what is it you guys are seeking? Let's make sure that we're laying a foundation that's right, right from the beginning. Verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and he said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated 
a stone. What do we do when we find something awesome? Well, we run over to the ones that we love and we go, man, you got to check this out. Man, you got to come see this. This is, this, this is incredible. We got to get them over there so we can give them the hookup. Hey, I got this. Come over here. Let's take a look at this. Andrew was the first one to hear Jesus say, come. Andrew. And he went and got his brother Peter. So we've got a disciple here, Andrew and Peter, right? And when Peter walks up, he doesn't know him. He has no, Peter's never met him. His brother just went and got him. Matt, put yourself in Peter's shoes. So he comes and grabs you, and you go over there, and as soon as you get to Jesus, he looks over and he goes, you're Peter, but now you're going to get called this. And you're like, okay. Walk over to this guy, and all of a sudden, I, I got a new name. But they knew who he was because of, of the way he was speaking and what was coming out of him. He had authority. All right, so 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, when we're, we're looking at this, and, and these guys have been in the word. These guys were looking through the scriptures, and he said, we found the one that the scriptures were talking about. This is him. We found him, as if he was lost. They, they found him. They said, look, we got him. He's here. Let me come check this out. So he does, right, in 46. And Nathaniel says, said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Whoa. Whoa. There's some, you know, there's some pretty bad cities around. You say, oh, he's from here. And you go, wow, man, can anything good come out of there? So what does he say? He goes, well, come and see. Come check this out. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now that would be a trip. He's renaming Peter. And he walks over and he looks at Nathaniel and he goes, an Israelite in which there is no deceit. You're kind of like, okay. I mean, sounds good. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel does a doyoyoy. What? Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, you, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jesus is like, You believe because there was a word of knowledge? I mean, you believe because I knew something? Oh, hang on a second. Hang on to your seatbelt because you ain't seen nothing yet. He's saying, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, Jesus likes that phrase. He repeats it. I had how many times, but I lost the number, but I counted them. The software with, with some of the Bible programs is awesome. You can punch it in and... And it tells you how many, and it's repeated over and over, son of man. It's a very important phrase, but that's not where it started. It doesn't start with Jesus. That phrase comes out of Daniel. Now, we read Daniel months back, and as we were going through it, we came across it. It was in Daniel 7. Daniel 7, verse 13, it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. They understood that phrase. When he said, you'll see the angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, they knew the phrase. They knew what was going on. 
because this was where some of the verses were coming from that they had been reading and relying on. So while they're sitting there talking to these guys and lays that phrase on them, they're blown away. First off, he gives them a word of knowledge. Well, you were just sitting underneath the fig tree. And that kind of sets him back like, yeah, I was sitting underneath the fig tree. But then he goes, let me explain. You're going to see the Son of Man the way it was described. And it just, it blows them away. Something that they've been seeing. It's one thing for us to talk about something in the Word, but then when it starts to actually happen in your lifetime, it takes a bit for you to grasp onto it. We've been talking about things being in the end times for a long time. They've been saying it for years. Oh, we're in the end times. We're in the end times. I even remember back in the 80s, there was a book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Return in 88. I bet you could find that book real cheap in thrift stores about now. But yet you're seeing these things turning and starting to happen and things and pieces are coming together. And, and we're looking around and we're going, wow, is happening like birth pains. You're seeing these things happen today. They're more drastic. They're closer together. That's just like the word was describing it. So we're kind of in the same regard. You know, the call of the church to go home is not far away the way these guys are seeing this. So Jesus knew who he was. And he was telling them that he is the conduit to heaven. He is the very conduit from the things that are on earth to heaven. No man goes to the Father except through him. In the guy's Bible study on Thursday, Chris is right. It always seems to be different. And this is the strangest thing. Maybe some of you girls remember this, but we were talking about how Jesus was 100% man, but he was 100% God too. He was not half God, half man. That's a demigod. That's, that's something like, like uh, um, Hercules in the mythology. He was half and half. God's one, Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. And I got to thinking about it, and I was like, it's like one of the uh, PVC pieces. i got to fix sprinklers around my place a lot. And you get one of those pieces of plastic for the water, right, Chris? And some of them, they have threads. And you take these two pieces and you screw them together because there's threads. But on another piece, it doesn't have any threads to it. It just slips on. You put glue on it, you slip it together. Well, what happens when you've got one that's got a slip part, another one that's got a threaded part? How do you get them two together? Well, you've got to have a piece that's both. So one slips in, and the other side of it screws in, and you put it together. Jesus is that conduit. Jesus is that one that puts together the heavenly and the earthly. This is why we are sons of God, but through him. He's the conduit. He's the one that makes this happen. Incredible. Incredible. So these disciples really just began a journey together with the Lamb of God. These guys, think about it. This journey, we've talked a lot about the end, the cross, the things that happened in, in Acts, the 120 in the upper room. You know that some of those 120 in the upper room, they're the ones we're talking about right here. He was doing his own thing. Maybe he was going to the market. Maybe he was picking up stuff for the fishing business. But whatever it was, he hears Jesus and he says, whoop, I'm following him. He just began that journey. What an incredible journey. So, as we see these guys, they're disciples. That's what it says, they're being called. What's a disciple? A disciple, uh, one uh, definition would be a disciplined one. That's what one of my teachers described it as. He, um, he covered a lot of the stuff that was the Hebrew side of things. A disciplined one. This is the one that studies. Uh, the children that are inside Hebrew school the, uh, to read and write, they actually use the Tanakh. This is what they use. They learn using that. They don't bring an outside source in. They use God's word. Well, when they gave it to him in the beginning and they're following the rabbi, he puts a, a bit of honey on the Tanakh. And when they taste that honey... It's to remind them that God's word is sweet. God's word is to be cherished. God's word is something that you hang on to. This is something that's, that's awesome and it's incredible. Um, a disciplined one will follow in the dust of the master. I remember Pastor Ken saying that the phrase was lek ahadai, and it was come and follow me. And it was one of those things that you didn't go, well, let me think about it. It wasn't one of those things when he would, the rabbi would walk over and go, hey, what do you got going on for the next 
three years. And you go, I don't know, let me check my calendar. It was one of those things where he said, follow me. And you just you dropped what you were doing, so let's go. That was it. That was the commitment. That was the, nothing else is more important than this, let's get going. And the people around you in that setting understood that when there was a call and you went, that's what you needed to do. It wasn't anything. Our Western culture, it changes so much. It turns so many things back where the importance is back on us or the importance is on something else that it shouldn't be. All right, so when we look at this, we start seeing what a disciple means. We are so close to Jesus that we are in his dust. When Jesus is walking, we're walking so close to him that the dust from his feet walking is getting on us. And that we cherish his word like it's valuable. Just like that honey that's on there, we cherish it, that it's valuable to us. That's why Jesus had asked these guys, what is it that you seek? What is it that you seek? Do you think that Jesus didn't know? He knew. The questions that he asked us in many times, what he's trying to do is he's trying to get you to see, I want you to see what you're seeking. I want you to double check something. I want you to start reprioritizing. What is it that you seek? So that the guys would back up and go, yeah, we're seeing you. We're seeking you. This is what we've been waiting on. So we, as disciples, are to preach the gospel to the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. You notice that it doesn't say argue about the gospel? You're going to find yourself in conversations about the word of God more now than you ever have because the gray area is disappearing. You're not finding people that go, well, that's okay with you or that's all right or they just kind of blend in. You're seeing that gray area disappear and they are saying things that are absolutely unbiblical. Our point is not to argue, but our point is to speak the word in truth. So when somebody says something, you, this is what the word says. Now, if it turns into an argument, we say, no, 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 I'm not here to argue. I'm just here to talk about what the word says. Because there are people that are just wandering in the darkness, repeating, parroting stuff that they heard from somewhere else. And they have no backing. This is something that pastor taught us years ago, and it was ingrained in us. Give me chapter and verse. You guys remember that? I don't care what came out of your mouth. When somebody says, give me chapter and verse, you better know why you're saying what you're saying. Do you know that when you say chapter and verse today, there are people that has the name Christian tacked on them that will attack you? Somebody said something that was unscriptural, and I said, do you have a verse for that? And he came back and said, boy, you think you're a know-it-all, don't you? Now, I'm not saying I don't get a little uppity sometimes. But in that instance, I just said, give me a verse. Because I know the word says that you should have a reason for the faith that lies within. And if I'm telling somebody something, I better dang sure know that it says it in the word. And I said, I don't think I'm smart nothing. I'm just repeating what the word says. Because you may show me something. You may show me something in the word where I look at it and go, Okay, I'm seeing something. So, if you can't give me a verse, and it seems like today, all we're doing is just repeating what Dr. Phil said. Well, did you hear what so-and-so said on the TV? No, it's not even that anymore. Did you hear what, what that guy said on YouTube? Because now we can just record these little borps and stick them on there, and there's gazillions. It used to just be three TV stations. Now, we've got gazillions of YouTube stuff, and people are just repeating nonsense. And you just go, okay, give me a verse. This is real simple. I mean, this is not like, well, I don't know enough. I didn't go to seminary. You're probably better off. What you need to know is a word. That's it. You know the word. And then that way, when you go chapter and verse, that's all I'm asking for, chapter and verse. Because if you do that, you're flying by the gauges. And everybody else is saying, you're going too low. Pull up. I'm looking at the gauges. It's right. I don't have to pull up. So... We're supposed to go out and preach that gospel. Now, as we do that, people will turn to the light. 
And as they turn to the light and they come to us and they speak to us about that and they go, oh my gosh, I was, I was just sitting there and I was praying to God and I said, God, if you're real, talk to me. And man, this thing came over and I knew, and man, and I go, brother, you are born again. And then I said, let's talk about what that means. Okay, now what are we doing? Making disciples. You don't make believers. That is where the arguments come in. That's when you walk over and go, why don't you listen to what I'm telling you? The word says this. Listen. It's, that's pride. Preach the word. When they're open and they're, the Holy Spirit, they respond to that call, they're going to hear it. But then when they go, oh, man, this is awesome. This is incredible. Man, I can't get enough. And you go, let's talk about the word. Let's talk about this. Let's look into this. Let's look how awesome God is. What are you doing? You're discipling him. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, and make disciples. That's what it says we're supposed to do. See, we're supposed to show them, to assist them, that reading his word is life itself. This is where we start showing them how to renew their mind from natural thinking to the word. Praying, conversing with the Father. Well, I don't know how to pray. You know how to talk, don't you? Right? You can jabber up a storm when you pull up in front of Jack in the Box in that box. You pull up there and go, I'll take a big one with a large one and three of those. Right? You can talk. You do just fine. Hey, you get out of my way. So if you can communicate, you go, God, it's me. And as you start talking, he starts listening. And as you get comfortable when you're talking to God, it's like, Lord, you are awesome. He wants to hear your heart. He doesn't want to hear some new old English King James thou's and these. It's the craziest thing I ever heard. When I hear people that start going, thou God in heaven, thine heavenly father. And, and I'm like, where did that come from? I mean, I, I mean, I get it, but do you, you think that it has to... I mean, I hate to tell you this, but Jesus did not speak Old English. I mean, it was Aramaic and Hebrew, and there was Greek in there, and he was speaking those things. That's what that... But he hears everything, so why don't you just go, God, it's me. God, it's me, Steve. Thine God in heaven, thou heavenly Father. Let's not get caught up in that. Showing them what it means to be a disciple, telling them what it's not... And you don't get all religious and being a disciple. I was watching a uh, mountain climbing thing. And as I'm checking this thing out, I, I really saw something interesting. As I watched this thing, there's a leader that had a rope and it was attached to the whole group. The whole group was attached with that one rope. And then as the, the, the leader was going up the side of this mountain, he's, he's putting in these... I don't know what you call them, but they're hooks. There's probably a real term for it. What are they? Pitons. See, I'm smart now. <laughs> Putting in pitons, you know. Is there something about the hammer, or is it just a hammer? Okay. All right. So he's putting in these pitons as he's going up this thing, right? And he's putting them in, and he's going up the way to, to lead this group up. And... As he went up, he was establishing the path as he was going up. And the whole group followed him. Every one of that group, they were climbing as a single unit with that leader leading the way. Everyone in this group was very serious about what was going on. They were not going to have some joker up there that was going to start trying to do somersaults and swing around. They, okay, look, we're very serious about what we're doing here going up this thing. Uh, each one of them knew that their actions were very important to the success of the whole group. It's important to understand that. One fall and the others that weren't anchored could pull the whole group down. You know? One leader even going the wrong way could lead the group down the wrong direction. The whole group's gone. One straying off on his own path you know, all of a sudden could pull that whole group down because they're all connected. I'm watching this thing and I'm seeing some incredible stuff. I saw that this is a great example of the life of a disciple. When you look at this, you see that a disciple does not climb this life alone. 
you're a disciple. And you are not climbing this life alone. We are attached to other disciples. We are also attached to the leader who's gone before us. And as an entire group is how we operate. The leader, our leader, has already gone ahead. Our leader has already blazed the trail and established the route that is the successful route for us to get to the top. Already done that. Setting the, the pitons strategically placed where the disciples can use them. When they get there, they know that that's what it is. As they climb, each one of us, we help each other along the climb. See, that's the idea behind the body of Christ. That's why not everybody is a finger and a toe and an eyeball. That's why there's all different parts, because we're all going to benefit each other on this. See, a lost foothold by a disciple further up can be caught by a disciple that's further down. And it may take one or it may take the next one down here that catches them and keeps them from falling. Or the one that's on the bottom, he loses a foothold or something comes loose. And when that thing comes loose, the ones that are on the top, they hang on to that rope. And they say, no one, no one dies. We're hanging on. We're staying together. And they keep them together. Everybody taking care of themselves. When the mental of the climb becomes too much, each one of them are, is encouraging each other by pointing out the leader already made it. This is not something that is impossible because the leader already made it. All we have to do, stay true to the path. All we have to do is keep walking this out. It's, it's a sure path. It's a true path. All we have to do is go ahead and finish it. The disciples, they all climb. And as we climb, we look up and we're doing it in faith. Sometimes we look up and that rope isn't attached to anything that we can see. It's coming off of the edge of a rock here and it's got a pretty good stretch down. And so by faith, we're going, well, let's go. Can you see that it's attached to something? No. You're pulling on it. It seems strong. So what are you doing? It's by faith. We're pulling on that rope, and we're climbing, and we're going. And the one below us may go, what are you doing? You don't even know what that is. You get away from this rock right here, and you may fall. And we encourage him, and we say, you know what? I know that he went before us. I know that this thing is anchored in. I know that that thing is solid, so I'm going to climb it. And as he sees us go, his faith is built up. He said, all right. If he went, I'm going to follow him. That's how the disciples work together. Our leader has already been challenged by everything on this mountain. Everything that it has to throw at us, our leader has already had thrown at him. Every rock, every loose section of gravel, every frayed rope, every avalanche, every broken hook, and he made it 100% victorious. Everything that this mountain could do to him, threw it at him, and he accomplished it. He was in victory. So there is no reason. This is why he had to be 100% human. Otherwise, we'd say, well, of course he made it. He's God. Just floated up the side. He was 100% human. He was in that cave for 40 days. He was hungry. He did get challenged by that. So when you see these things, they're not allegorical. These are absolutely things. Oh, well, I've got a temper. Do you think that stuff didn't happen to Jesus that he wouldn't have exploded on them with a temper? Over and over and over, everything that we go through, he's gone through. Every single thing. And he had victory in it. Every single thing. And right now, he's on the top of the mountain, He's got that rope tied off around him. That is the strongest thing that that rope could be tied off. Him. There is nothing stronger to be anchored to than him. And he's got that rope tied off, and that is what we are climbing to. And he's helping us to get to him. That is the entire existence. He's helping us get to him. 
And there's only one ending. There's only one choice. We get there. That's it. There is no other choice. We get there. The point is, as you're going up there, if you have this perspective that this is what's going to happen, the challengers along that way, you're going to look at them differently. As you're climbing up the side of that, you're going to look at them much differently. I'm going to get to the top. He's going to help me get to the top. If I need to leap from this side over here to this side over here, and there's nothing for hundreds of feet down, I know that he's going to get me to the top. So I'm going to swing over there, and I'm going to keep going, because that's what he's got planned for me to do. If there's a challenge that came into my life, I already know that he has given me whatever it takes to overcome that challenge. There is no challenge that's going to be given to you that you cannot overcome. Not one. Not one thing. So whatever it is that's coming, you just stop yourself and you say, I can do this. God's given it to me. He already knows I can do it. The, I look at this as these people, and I start thinking, what's the characteristics of a disciple? I mean, I mean, really, if you think about it, some of these smart aleck people that are trying to throw rocks at us, they always say, well, that's not very Christian, Mike. You know, they catch you on a, on a maybe not so good situation or not so good day. Maybe you, maybe you unleash some, uh, some stuff on somebody. And of course, there's always somebody that you've been trying to share the word with and they look over and they've got to have something smart to say, well, that wasn't very Christian, Mike. Well I, well, I guess you're not. You're not a Christian. See, that's how the world portrays believers. Is that somehow or another, when you're a believer, you suddenly, ooh, you're perfect. I think I'm in the right room. That ain't right. <laughs> it ain't. It just ain't. The whole point is your heart. What does your heart say? Man, I love God. And as I walk towards him, climb towards him, there's going to be times that I'm like, oh, man, there's going to be times I miss it. But I'm not making room for that. I'm just saying, I'm going forward. I'm not going to focus on that. And I'm going to keep going. But there's always these, these folks that say that kind of thing. And you go, okay, so what is the characteristics of a believer then? What is that? Because that really gets into that once saved, always saved versus you lose your salvation. Because then all of a sudden they go, well, you know, sinners can't go to heaven. Okay. I don't know a single person that calls himself a believer that doesn't have something they're being challenged with. So are you telling me that all of those people are not saying, well, then basically what you're telling me, heaven's going to be a very lonely place. I mean, the angels and Jesus will be playing a pickup game because there ain't going to be any humans there. Because I don't know anybody that doesn't have something that they're being challenged with. So what does it look like? What is the characteristics of that? A disciple, to start off with, they humble themselves. A disciple is humble. They humble themselves. That first off, they humble themselves by saying, I need a savior. I can't do it on my own. I can't. I just can't do it on my own. I need a savior. I am in need. The world wants to walk around saying, no, I'm good. I'm perfect. I don't need nothing. I'm good. But you know what? That's exactly what Laodicea had the letter written to him. Oh, we're rich and have need of nothing. Thanks. Go ahead. Go to the next house. We're sitting here going, no, humble, I need a Savior. I will not make it up this mountain without our leader. I will not make it up the side of that mountain without our Savior. Not just for the fire insurance of it. I mean for the entire existence, our entire being, our entire existence. We need a Savior. When you go to sleep at night, when you wake up in the morning, when you go out and function in the world, we need a Savior. A disciple reads and hears the word of God, it rings true to them. When they read that, it, it's like mother's milk. It's like, it, it is something you can't get enough of. And, and we always remain in a teachable position. See, for us to be a disciplined one, we have to be in a position where we can say, I'm here to listen. Because if you ever think that you've learned it all, then you've gotten to a point where you've created God in your own image. You need to get to a place where you say, here I am, I'm listening. Do you realize that there are three created beings that are flying around and around and around that throne and have been? And you know what they say? They say, holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord God Almighty. And they are going around, and every time that they're going around, they're seeing something deeper in God. You're never going to see the end. He's infinitely awesome. So when, even when we're in heaven, we will have a much better grasp than we do now, but you still won't see the bottom. You still won't see all of it that he is. So we have to remain teachable. A disciple of Jesus Christ is more than a student, more than a follower, more than just an admirer. See, there were, there were disciples of, uh, um, who was the guy that had the cross on his forehead? Um, Charles Manson. There were disciples of, and I forgot the name of them, but they actually had a group. That's not the same thing. Those are just followers. Those are just groupies. There's, there's more to it than that. We are committed to being with Jesus. Body, spirit, and soul. Every bit of it. We are committed to be with him. Nothing is more important than us being with him. Luke 14, 33 tells us, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Everything that you have must fall second. And I don't mean God is number one on a list of. I mean God's number one on a list of one. Everything else is not even on that list. We have to have Jesus' heart be our heart. See, the things that he loves, we love. The things he hates, we hate. The things that, that he finds pleasure in, we should find pleasure in. His heart, it needs to be our heart. A disciple receives blessings here in this life, but we receive them as they're intended. There is nowhere in Scripture that tells you that you've got to be broke, falling apart, living in the gutter, scraping by. That's not what a son of the king does. But the things that we receive here, we receive them as they are intended. They're things to be used here. They're not to be put any kind of importance to them. They're not to be lifted up in any higher regard than anything else. They are simply just things that are here. And they are resources that can be used to further the kingdom. I mean, think about it. When you go home, you should not feel guilty that you turn on a hot water heater and get a hot shower. Oh my gosh. You know, I'm indulging in something. Or the fact that you got a roof over your head. Or the fact that you got a car that's not breaking down. Father loves blessing his kids. We just want to make sure that that blessing doesn't overtake us. It doesn't become a distraction to us. But he, a disciple is absolutely blessed. And he lives it out. And what is he? His heart is the heart of God. It's a giver. It's a giving heart. And when that kind of a disciple, you can't outgive God, you're always going to have plenty to give to someone else. And it's always going to be like that. That's one of the characteristics of a disciple. As we grow in our understanding of who we are as sons of God, we are meek. And you have to remember that meek does not mean weak. Meek would be better described as power that is just restrained. See, we are one with Jesus and all that he is. We are his righteousness. But we don't go walking around like that brat. We've all seen uh, movies where there's a king and the prince, the son of the king, is just a spoiled, rotten brat. He walks around telling people what to do and don't you know who I am? That's not the son. That's not the actions of a son. That's not the actions of a disciple. A disciple would walk around and show the king's goodness, his graciousness. He would live out the love of the king. He would be the ambassador for the king and live out and do the things that the king would do. Mark 5.5 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is where we realize that we are in a substantial position, but only because of God. Only because of God. And we're still learning. When a disciple stumbles, they, they, they make a mistake. They stumble. They get up, and they run to Father. 
they, with skinned knees and crying, we know that Father loves us and will never turn us away. We have an absolute understanding that we are one with him, and when something happens, he does not have a relationship with us where we cringe, where we're going to run the other direction because he's going to smack us. When something happens, we immediately feel like we can't do anything else until we run to Father. And we grab onto him, sobbing, and Lord, and he goes, I got you. Let's go. Let's get going. He dusts you off and get going. That's a disciple. A disciple is not always the smartest, not always the most knowledgeable. It's not that they are the perfect goody goodies, making no mistakes. A disciple genuinely loves Jesus with their whole heart. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. See, I got to thinking about these disciples that Jesus is calling. And everything that I sum it up to is that a disciple goes to God with nothing. I got nothing except an honest heart. And he goes to God with that heart, and he says, Lord, I'm here, and I love you. That's all he does. He, he walks in that, and he walks in that honesty, and he walks in that where he's going forward, and the entire thing uh, that makes him the disciple is how he's humble, and how he walks in that love, and he just says, Father, I love you. And of course, it would be easy for God to respond, I loved you first. Amen? So as we're going through the disciples, I think that was just real important to pick up how, how looking at what real disciples were. And I really think that as we go through this first part, as these disciples are, are surfacing, I think we're going to really see how, how they were really people. We've got these things like, oh, well, that was Peter. You know, well, that was St. Peter. Oh. When you look at that, you go, St. Peter was a fisherman. And let me tell you what, he was just like anybody else. He was a, like a dock worker, rough and tough, give me the work, I'll get it done. You know, you messed with him, he probably just socked you. So this guy was just as real as we are. So you can really take this word and go, I'm a disciple. I'm a disciple. And, you, and, and when you're going, man, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, you tell the devil to shut up. And you run to Father. And you go, okay, this is where we're going. And, and it just puts you in a place where there's absolutely no condemnation. That condemnation is of the devil. That condemnation has nothing to do with God. You say, I'm a disciple. And that's how we walk it out. Amen? All right, so... Thank you for tuning in to the Refuge Church YouTube channel. We pray that you received a word that brings peace to your soul and joy to your heart. In these days that we are living in, chaos is increasing and it's important to have our hope in the one who brings order, Jesus Christ. Refuge Church is a group of believers who have their hope in God, His Word, and His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We believe that growth occurs in small groups. If you're looking to fellowship with a group like this, you are welcome to join us at Refuge. We are located at 24711 Redlands Boulevard, Suite K in Loma Linda, California, 92354. Our men's Bible study meets on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Our women's Bible study meets on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We meet for praise and worship every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. If this message has blessed you and you'd like to link shields with us and support this ministry financially to help continue the work that we do for the kingdom, you can log on to our website at www.refuge-church.com and click the giving button. To access more teaching from the Refuge, log on to our website and click on the audio and video button. These will give you the links to our YouTube channel and to our podcast. 
We'd be glad if you joined us. Thanks again. And we pray that the Lord blesses you and keeps you as you grow in his word.